Good evening, and welcome to International House here at the University of Chicago and to this very special program. My name is Denise Jorgens, and I'm the Director of Programs and External Relations here at International House. This evening's program is co-sponsored by the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, the Consulate General of Israel to the Midwest, and the International House Global Voices Program. Throughout the year, the Global Voices Lecture Series presents prominent speakers and organizes roundtable discussion groups and special interest conferences and seminars. As a part of this program, leading figures from the world stage come to share their thoughts and exchange ideas with students and members of the community on a variety of current topics. The Global Voices Program enables International House to maintain its strong links with the city of Chicago in ways that are commensurate with its institutional position of promoting cross-cultural understanding and respect and the exchange of ideas among people of all nations and backgrounds. Information about other upcoming programs is available on our literature table in the entryway. And tonight we are pleased to welcome the Honorable Michael Oren, Israeli Ambassador to the United States. Moderating our program this evening is Professor Fred Donner. Fred Donner is professor in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations and is the director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. And now I'd like to welcome Professor Fred Donner to the podium to begin our program. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Welcome, everyone. It's a uh, real honor for me to be able to introduce our speaker tonight and to moderate the program. And I'd like to thank especially the Consul General of Israel to the Midwest, especially Consul Gill, for making this program possible by having the ambassador come. Uh, and I also want to thank International House and its staff, especially uh, Denise Jorgens, from whom you just heard, and Mary Beth DiStefano for all the work they put into making this possible, and also the staff of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. It's not often that we can welcome a current sitting or standing or whatever amb serving ambassador uh, in our midst. Uh, so this is indeed a special occasion. I want to remind everyone that civility in our discourse is of the ultimate importance. At the University of Chicago, freedom of expression is vital to our shared goal of the pursuit of knowledge in order to promote rigorous inquiry and to allow all members of the community to learn and share ideas, we must protect civil discourse. That means that we must honor civil discourse both when listening to featured speakers and when participating in question and answer sessions that follow as one will today. Disrupting speakers will result in removal from this event anyway. We appreciate your help in supporting these fundamental values. The order of the program tonight is very simple. Um, after my formal introduction, uh, the ambassador will speak. Uh, and then when he's finished with his prepared remarks, uh, he'll sit down and uh, we'll, he will entertain questions from you. Uh, we're going to have the questions uh, in the form of questions written on cards. I think there may have been cards on your seats when you sat down. If not, there will be cards available from ushers at the side of the aisles. So when he's done, you can write down your question and they'll be collected and brought up to me and I will read the questions uh, to the ambassador uh, to uh, answer them. We've used this procedure in the past. It turns out to be uh, actually a very efficient uh, procedure. You uh, get through more questions in less time this way. And now it's my Great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, the Honorable Michael Oren, the Ambassador of the State of Israel to the United States. Ambassador Oren took his BA from Columbia University and followed that with a Master's in International Affairs at Columbia. Uh, sometime later, he took a doctorate at uh, Princeton University in Near Eastern Studies in 1986. Uh, he did a term of military service in Israel and then entered diplomatic service. Uh, he's been since 2009, Israel's ambassador to the United States. As if this weren't already enough, he also has had a rather amazing career as 
a scholar and author. Um, he served as a visiting professor at Yale, Harvard, and Georgetown, uh, various connections with various Israeli universities. Uh, and he's the author of several books, uh, two in particular of great importance to us, um, one called Six Days of War, June 1967, 1967 and the Making of the Modern Middle East, and uh, more recently, uh, Power, Faith, and Fantasy, America in the Middle East, 1976 to the, 1776 to the present, which was a, uh, yeah, <laughs> 1776 to the present, so a very long uh, term study. Uh, which was very positively reviewed and uh, was, I don't know, many weeks on the New York Times bestseller. It was quite a remarkable accomplishment, won a number of uh, prestigious book awards. Uh, so he's uh, obviously a multifaceted uh, individual, and it's a really a great honor to have him address us today. His presentation will be on the U.S.-Israel relationship. Uh, please join me in welcoming the Honorable Michael Arendt. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Professor Donner. Thank you, Denise. Uh, thank you to my esteemed colleague, uh, Orly Gill, the Council General here. And just a quick introduction, shout out for Ms. Lee Moser. Will you stand up for a second? She's actually won't stand up. Say hi. Um, she's the, the head of our office in uh, the embassy in Washington, who makes my presence here, indeed my presence anywhere possible. Thank you, Lee. Um, I'll begin today with three sort of scenarios, three scenes from a an, ambassador, an Israeli ambassador's life in the United, in the United States. Uh, first scene, I get invited by the U.S. Navy to fly out to an American aircraft carrier, the USS Truman, the name is significant, which is cruising somewhere between the vicinity of the coast of Turkey and um, the island of Rhodes to address 5,200 crew members on the history of the U.S. Israel Reliance. So I go to a, an obscure airfield outside of Tel Aviv, and there there's a naval aircraft waiting, a propeller-driven aircraft. They stick a bunch of earphones on me, they strap me into a chair, and then we fly out into the middle of the Mediterranean. Nobody tells me that this airplane is going to go from 188 miles an hour to zero in less than one second landing on the aircraft carrier. I don't recommend anybody do this, because you land, and you're here in your seat, and your eyeballs are somewhere up in that, you know, in the gallery. Absolutely horrific. I thought we had crashed. Walk out, and there's this American city floating in the center of the, middle of the Mediterranean. Again, 5,200 crew members who are lined up to hear me give a lecture about the history of the United States-Israel relationship. Extraordinary experience. Why? Why is that happening? A couple months ago, I go and visit Denver, Colorado. State visit to Denver, Colorado. I'm hosted by both houses of the Colorado Assembly. And both houses of the Colorado Assembly pass resolutions separately in support of the U.S. as a relationship. Unequivocal support for the state of Israel, America's ally, great democratic state in the Middle East, an important strategic partner. Um, and both these resolutions, in my presence, passed unanimously. No one stands up, no one raises an issue about it, unanimously passing both these resolutions. In Colorado, which has, you know, sort of a sizable popula Jewish population in Denver, but outside of Denver doesn't have a very big Jewish population, why is, are the houses of the Assembly of Colorado passing this outstanding resolution in support of the U.S.-Israel relationship? Last vignette, occurred several weeks ago. I was visiting Cincinnati, my city, Cincinnati. Believe it or not, it was recently listed as, by Lonely Planet as one of the most fun cities in the United States. Cincinnati. And um, I visit the New Jerusalem African American Baptist Church on Sunday. I go to church quite often on Sunday. I talk to Christian groups. And um, I walk into this African American church, and I am greeted exuberantly exuberantly, enthusiastically. I would even go as far as to say rapturously. Everyone surrounding want to hear the word from the Israeli uh, ambassador, and it was just this amazing, amazing experience at the New Jerusalem uh, Baptist Church in Cincinnati. What, what is all of this about? What are these vignettes telling us about the relationship between the United States and Israel? And that is that it is one of, if not the most, multifaceted and deepest alliances which this country, the United States, has had with any foreign nation 
in its post-World War II period. And the reasons for that are not simple. They go back. They go back well before Israel's creation in 1948. It goes back, in some cases, 400 years ago when the first buckled shoe lit upon a certain rock off the Massachusetts shore. That buckled shoe, of course, belonged to the uh, Puritan pilgrims. And the pilgrims were interesting. They had suffered he heavily at the hands of the official church of England. And in an attempt to find a biblical model that would better enable them to cope with their suffering in England, they looked into the New Testament. They didn't find it. They looked back to what they called the Old Testament. And they found something very unusual. They found a God who spoke directly to his people in their own language. It's interesting. God in the Bible only speaks one language. It's Hebrew. And um, they liked the story. They fashioned themselves as the new Israel. They began to give Hebrew names to their kids. That's why you have the David and the Benjamin and the Rebekahs and the Sarahs. They likened England to Egypt. They were in slavery there. They got out of slavery there. They crossed the Atlantic Ocean, which they likened to the Sinai. And they landed in this country, in the East Coast, which they immediately called the New Promised Land and gave a thousand Hebrew names to their cities and, and, their, and, their, and their towns. That's why if you go out to the East Coast, certainly the original 13 states, you've got a lot of Jerichos and Bethlehems and Sharons and Zions. And if you're Long Island, you've got Bethany and Bethpage. By the way, they're all in Jerusalem. Um, and uh, they made Hebrew a required language at their universities. You'll appreciate this, Professor Donna. Do you know that uh, Hebrew was a required language at Princeton, and James Madison took it and failed. He had, he had to take an extra year at Princeton because he couldn't, do, couldn't get Hebrew down. But you know Hebrew's in the logo of Yale. It's in the illegal logo of Dartmouth, logo of Columbia. They had to study Hebrew. So deeply ingrained was this biblical narrative in the hearts and minds of uh, the founding father and mother generation. At the conclusion of the American Revolution in, in 1783, there was a big debate over what was going to be the great seal of the United States. And a certain group of American leaders thought we should have the American bald eagle and perfectly wonderful bird. But there was another group of American leaders that said, no, the, the, the great seal of the United States should be Moses leading the children of Israel out of bondage into the promised land. And there really was a very close debate. And America came about this close to having Moses as its national symbol. And it lost out to the, you know, the follically challenged bird. But uh, you should know that the designers of the Moses seal were no less than John, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. So this was not an obscure notion. Now, as the, uh, as the new Israel, Many of these founding fathers and mothers thought that they had a close kinship relationship with the old Israel, the Jews. And as the heirs to a new promised land, they had a close association with the old promised land, then known as Palestine. And they concluded that to be good Christians, to be good Americans, it was their divinely ordained duty to help those old Jews go back and reestablish their state in their ancient homeland. And thus was born this notion of restorationism which was not at all an obscure or per peripheral notion in post-colonial America. You have someone like John Adams, the second president of the United States, saying it was his fondest dream that 100,000 Jewish soldiers would march back into Judea and reclaim it as a Jewish state. Or Abraham Lincoln in 1863 saying he had a vision of helping the Jews to restore their statehood after he had healed the wounds of the American uh, Civil War. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, um, Woodrow Wilson, who was the grandson and son of Presbyterian ministers, said he, could, he felt his greatest blessing was helping the Jews to, get, to return to their holy land. And he was instrumental in convincing what became the League of Nations to give a mandate to the British that would help the Jews rebuild their homeland. That, of course, became the Partition Resolution uh, of 1947. And then several months later, in May 1948, when the President of the United States had to decide whether to recognize uh, the recreated Jewish state on the day of its birth, on May 14th, uh, he had quite a dilemma because the State Department was saying, don't do it, it's going to drag America into war, it's going to result in a cutoff of oil. But the president was Harry Truman, and he had had a very strict uh, religious upbringing, a Baptist upbringing, he claimed to have memorized the Bible. And um, when he, 11 minutes after Israel declared its independence, he made the United States the first nation on earth to, to recognize the recreated Jewish state and asked later why he did this, why he went against the advice of all his senior foreign policy analysis, he said he had one word. He said, uh, I'm Cyrus, he said. I'm Cyrus. Anybody know your Bible? Cyrus was the ancient Persian king who helped restore the Jews to their ancient 
uh, homeland after they were exiled. So Truman thought of himself as, as Cyrus. So there was a deep spiritual connection between the idea of America and idea of this recreated Jewish state well before uh, the announcement of Israel's independence on May 14th, 1948. But Israel comes into being not only as a Jewish state, it comes into being as a democratic state. And that added a, a completely new and very strong stratum of connection between the, uh, the United States and the state of Israel. Uh, Israel, like the United States, has representative government. We have a Knesset, a parliament. We have the rule of law. We have an independent judiciary. Um, in uh, Israel, today, at 64 years old, is older than more than half of the democracies in the world. And it's a member of a very small club, of which the United States is also a member. That club of those countries, those democratic countries, that have never known a second of non-democratic rule. And given the fact that Israel has never had a moment of peace either, and that peace at war is a notorious crusher of democracies throughout history, uh, that's quite an accomplishment for Israel. I frankly think it's, it's Israel's greatest accomplishment, that we have never had any interregnum of non-democratic rule. Um, we are a country in which no leader is above the law. Recently, we had a former president of Israel sentenced to a long prison term for sexual offenses by a Supreme Court panel that included uh, two women and an Arab Supreme Court judge. Uh, we are the only country in the Middle East that offers equal rights for homosexuals. As a matter of fact, we actually have a, a Palestinian exile community in Tel Aviv that has found shelter uh, there. Every year, the state of Israel, in the face of great opposition from some religious groups, uh, Jewish, Muslim, and Christian, holds the uh, Gay Independence Day, uh, Gay in uh, International Gay Pride uh, Parade in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Um, Same-sex couples. We never had don't ask, don't tell in Israel. Um, very much a world a regional leader in that field. Uh, women's rights. There's been a lot written re recently about um, a possible erosion of women's rights in Israel, and there are some large religious organization, uh, uh, populations in Israel who have, um, are very, for, for, for whom uh, separation of the sexes is an important issue. And we always have to counterbalance, like any democracy, uh, the values of democracy and pluralism, but the fact of the matter is discrimination, discrimination against women in Israel is illegal. And those people who abused or discriminated against women in Israel were arrested, and the police came in and, and made sure that that didn't happen again. Israel right now, of its 120-member parliament, has 24 uh, women members. The government has four women ministers. The heads of, of both uh, opposition parties, until uh, as of last week, one of them just got unseated, were women. Until recently, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was a woman. We have a, a women general, uh, woman general on our uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, so uh, Israel is also a regional uh, leader in, in women's rights. Um, a great affinity there between the United States and Israel. If you come to some cities in the United States, New York, you'll find a Ben-Gurion Street named after our founding father. You'll find a Golda Meir Street. We had a, women, a woman prime minister. And if you go to... Why, if you go to my hometown in Jerusalem, you'll find a Washington Street, you'll find a Lincoln Street, though they, people do not pronounce it Lincoln, they say Lincoln. <laughs> Very hard in Hebrew to say Lincoln. Um, Lincoln Street, uh, Israel is the only country in the Middle East that has a memorial for John and Fitzgerald Kennedy. It is the only country in the world, the only country in the Middle East that has a memorial for Martin Luther King. We actually commemorate Martin Luther Luther King Day in Israel. It is the only country in the Middle East that has a very large 9-11 uh, memorial just outside of Jerusalem. And we are the only country that has a park named for and including an exact replica of uh, the Liberty Bell, Liberty Bell Park in downtown Jerusalem. So all, all that is part of the uh, great connectedness between the American and Israeli democracies. So you had the spiritual connection. You had the democratic uh, affinity. What you did not have was a strategic alliance. Anybody who said that the United States and Israel have had a strategic alliance going back to 1948 is wrong, doesn't know their history. Uh, before uh, 1967, the United States did not sell a helmet to the state of Israel, did not sell a bullet to the state of Israel. There was no strategic alliance. The United States actually, for most of that period, had an arms embargo of Israel, stemming back from the War of Independence in 1948. But all that changed in six days uh, in 1967 the Six-Day War, um, where uh, the Israeli army defeated a number of Arab armies that were backed by the Soviets at the time. And on the, um, 
so-called seventh day of that war, American policymakers woke up and said, wait a minute, there's this little superpower in the Middle East that just defeated a lot of Soviet proxies. We should be allied with that country. And thus was born the US-Israel Strategic Alliance. Israel had always been a close ally of the United States in terms of voting in the UN, on, on the Cold War in Korea. Um, uh, even just recently, we remain that way. Our voting records in the United States are very much the same. There was recently a vote on, uh, on the Cuban embargo in the General Assembly. It was 184 to 2. Okay? You can imagine who the two was, United States and Israel. Still, no strategic alliance. The strategic alliance begins uh, after 67. Many of you know that Israel receives aid from the, from, from the United States, about $3 billion a year in military aid, not civilian aid. 75% uh, of that aid is spent in the United States, some of it in this area, the greater Chicago area, it creates tens of thousands of jobs. The United States tells us what we're going to buy with this money. And, uh, but what do you get for the $3 billion? $3 billion is the, is the cost of about one half of a modern um, patrol boat, a cruiser, a light cruiser in the Navy. Um, but what do you get for that? Well, first of all, you get an immense amount of cooperation in systems development, in particular anti-ballistic development. Both the United States and Israel face uh, seemingly uh, insurmountable challenges from uh, missile arsenals around the world, which have just grown exponentially in the last uh, decade. For example, 50,000 rockets in the hands of Hezbollah in, in Lebanon, uh, 10,000 Hamas around the world, missile threats. Um, and hitting, getting one missile to hit another missile in midair is literally rocket science. It's getting a bullet to hit another bullet. It's, it has never been done. Um, there are a number of missile systems. None of them have ever proven effective in combat until recently. Just recently now, an a Israeli-developed, uh, American-backed system called the Iron Dome uh, proved effective in combat. It took down dozens of rockets fired by Islamic Jihad, for example, about two weeks ago, uh, out of the Gaza Strip. But also, we are joined in building two other systems, an intermediate-range system called David Sling, which can interdict medium-range missiles, cruise missiles, and uh, two other systems, the Arrow 2 and Arrow 3, which can take out uh, suborbital and orbital ICBMs. Again, literally rocket science. Very, very complicated. United States and Israel cooperate in protecting American troops from inter improvised explosive devices, which have caused just tremendous uh, casualties among American uh, fighting troops in, in Iraq at first, later in Afghanistan. Uh, we cooperate in, um, in um, unmanned um, aerial vehicles, UAVs, uh, which patrol the skies over American troops. They also suppose the skies, patrol the skies over, over the uh, uh, border between the United States and uh, and some countries where there's a lot of drug smuggling in the Caribbean were involved with homeland security as well there. Um, American naval vessels, vessels pay, pay, pay important ports of call visit to Haifa. Uh, American um, military aircraft land in Israel. That was where I met, remember I met that naval aircraft, the Tel Aviv airport, there was a reason why it's there. They use Israel as a stopover point, and Israel is exquisitely located at the nexus of, of three continents. So in terms of a, a strategic location, it doesn't get any better than that. Um, we are involved in development of, uh, of aeronautical technology. Every, I can't go into detail too much on this, every American military aircraft, whether it be fixed wing or helicopter, incorporates crucial Israeli components and crucial Israeli uh, concepts. None of them fly without us. That kind of relationship. You don't, you don't get deeper than that. On the intelligence level, we are sharing intelligence daily at the highest and most intimate level. Uh, we share what we have with the United States. The United States shares what uh, they have. Um, we see things very much eye to eye in terms of developments in the region. Um, we look at the same materials. We don't always join the same conclusions, but we look at the same materials. And uh, I can't think of a closer relationship than, than, the, than the United States has with the, Ameri with the Israeli intelligence community. Um, but Israel is involved not only in, in, on the battlefield, uh, and conducting wars together with the United States, Israel is involved in saving American lives. Now, some of you may be a little bit young to remember the beginning of the Iraq and Afghani war, a little bit. Uh, but uh, so those of us who aren't uh, remember that there was a lot of controversy in this country that American military vehicles had gone over uh, to these areas without being sufficiently armored. Remember the whole Humvee crisis? Um, a small kibbutz, a small communal farm in northern Israel um, 
not coincidentally founded by Americans in 1949, came up with a do-it-yourself overnight armoring kit that managed to, over the course of the next decade, managed to armor 20,000 American armored vehicles, American military vehicles, and saved untold lives. At the embassy, we, we get the thank you notes. We get the thank you notes from the, from the, from the parents, even from the grandparents, from the kids, for saving their, their sons, their fathers. Um, it has really, it's been a real game changer, and it continues to armor all these American, Israel, American vehicles. Israel, also a, a small startup in Jerusalem, developed a, um, a high-tech bandage that applies pressure from the inside on a wound. And um, that bandage was in the medical bag of a member of a SWAT team in Tucson, Arizona, the day that Gabby Giffords, the congresswoman, was shot. And they immediately applied that bandage to her head wound and saved her life. Israel has, has supplied over a million of these bandages uh, to American fighting troops uh, in Afghanistan and the Middle East. So it's, uh, we're very much engaged in, in saving lives as well. Together, the United States and Israel have mounted humanitarian missions around the world uh, in cooperation with the U.S. State Department and the U.S. military. Israel was ma managed to be the first on the ground in earthquake-stricken Haiti uh, with a fully manned and fully operational uh, medical unit. Uh, we did something very similar in Turkey. Uh, we did something very similar in Indonesia. Uh, we have, um, we're involved in humanitarian missions in Africa, in, um, in, uh, in drought relief, agricultural development, education, women's empowerment programs, also in South America, all in cooperation uh, with the United States. And all of that forms under, falls under the rubric of sort of the strategic alliance. But it doesn't end there. And I, I came into this job, as, as Professor Donna said earlier, as a person who had spent a lot of time doing research on this subject. And I came in thinking I, I pretty much knew it all. But it turned out taking the job was very humbling for me, because it turned out that I learned very, I knew very little. And there was one area of the U.S.'s relationship that I had no idea about whatsoever, and that is the burgeoning commercial ties between the United States and Israel. Today, Israel is America's 20th largest customer in the world. We're bigger than Argentina, we're bigger than Russia, we're bigger than Saudi Arabia, we're bigger than Spain. We're the 12th largest export destination for the United States. Over the last decade alone, America has invested, or Americans have invested something in the order of $80 billion in the state of Israel. Israelis have, have invested about $55 billion here at a time when American corporations, alas, are exporting a lot of their jobs to Asia. We're outsourcing jobs to the United States. Tens of thousands of Americans are employed in Israeli companies here. Uh, you use some of their products, whether you, you eat Strauss, you know, Sabra Hummus, that's a, the one that people tend to like. But uh, one that you don't like are Teva pills. Teva is the largest generic pill maker in the world, uh, largest generic pharmaceutical company. One out of every five pills that you take, and I hope you don't have to take them, uh, you take in this country is an Israeli pill. Um, and, uh, and that includes your antibiotics. It also includes the, the little pill that you swallow that takes a little picture of your insides if you're having indigestion. That's an Israeli innovation as well. Um, every, just about every uh, large high-tech corporation in this country has its R&D center in Israel. Israel's a high-tech miracle. Motorola, IBM, uh, now Apple, Google, all have their R&D centers in Israel. Uh, if you have Intel in your computer, you have Israeli Israel in your computer. They, we make the microchips. You know that, uh, that intuitive search box you have, you begin to type something in, and the computer guesses what you're, gonna, you're looking for? That's an Israeli innovation. Your USB flash drive is from Israel. Um, all of your computers, all of your cell phones work with Israeli components, including about 70% of your computer and, and cell phone LCD screens, which are, uh, are made in Israel. So you are involved in Israel, irrespective of your political affiliation, you have Israel in your life uh, in various ways. Now, this is, this is all entirely new. Um, this has been really a development of the last, say, 10, 15 years. Um, and Israel is a world leader not only in, in medical uh, technology, but in the search for, a, uh, for alternative energy. Some of you have ever heard of Better Place. It's this revolutionary concept about uh, creating an entire enclosed system for electric cars. Uh, the entire state of Israel is going to be transformed into a laboratory for these electric cars. Uh, and we are exporting this system now to, uh, to Japan, to Hawaii, to Iceland. And we hope to help uh, President Obama fulfill his pledge uh, to get a million electric cars on American roads by uh, 2015. So 
you have all of these different components, these different aspects, the origins and roots of the Israeli, uh, Israel relation, American relationship, the spiritual tie, the, 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 the democratic bonds, the strategic alliance, the, the growing commercial uh, relationship. Do we agree on everything? Guess what? We don't. Like even the closest allies in history, those of you who study history, remember the British-American uh, alliance during World War II, lots of disagreements there. We have a long-standing disagreement over Israel's settlement policy, and I'm sure you're going to have questions about it, so I won't go too different, too deeply detailed about it now. Um, but right now, our position uh, on the uh, settlement policy on Jerusalem, a long-standing distance going back not to the beginning of the Bob administration, but to the Truman administration in 1948, a disagreement over the, uh, our Israel's uh, policy toward Jerusalem. But overwhelmingly, Overwhelmingly, we see eye to eye uh, both on broad uh, regional issues as well as specific issues relating to the peace process with the Palestinians. And though we've had some tactical disagreements about how to get to the end point, we have no disagreement about the end point. The end point is two states for two people, uh, a Jewish state called the state of Israel, which is the nation state of the Jewish people, and the nation state of the Palestinian people, Palestine, uh, that will live side by side in mutual uh, security, mutual recognition, uh, and peace. And we agree that there's no alternative to reaching that goal than by Israeli and American, by Israeli and Palestinian interlocutors sitting down and negotiating face by face. There's no alternative to it. We agree that there's no place for terrorists at the negotiating table. We agree on so many different things. Um, and in fact, the tactical difference, disagreements between us today are much, much less. On the Iranian issue, probably the most uh, complex and, um, and, and tense issue of our day. Uh, we look at the situation in Iran, we agree where Iran is on its nuclear program. Um, we agree in Israel that uh, the, the need for diplomacy, which would include crippling uh, sanctions and a credible military threat stands the best chance of dissuading the Iranian regime from pursuing nuclear weapons. And in a speech in Washington, Oh, about three weeks ago, um, President Obama said some very important things for us uh, in that way. He said, uh, a, that um, he remained absolutely determined to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons, that uh, all options remained on the table. One of those options was a military option. One of those options was not, I stress, was not containment. Israel, he said, has a right to defend itself against any Middle Eastern threat or any combination of Middle Eastern threats, and only Israel as a sovereign nation can best determine how to defend its citizens from threats. Very important issue. Altogether, we look at the Middle East today, Middle East that is in high state of flux, very flammable. And by the way, here the United States and Israel again agree on the situation in Syria. We agree on the situation on, in Egypt. Are, are the way we look at the transformation that is occurring throughout the Middle East are very, very similar. We look at it and we see a tremendous amount of uncertainty. Nobody knows what the Middle East is going to look like, never mind next year, next month. Nobody knows. But there's one thing which the United States and Israel together can be certain of. And that is that there will be one state that will remain democratic, it will remain stable, it will remain financially sound, it will be able to defend itself, and the Israeli armed forces is larger than the British and the French armies combined, and it will remain unequivocally pro-American. You will not find an anti-American demonstration in the state of Israel, you will not find American flags being burnt there, Ever, ever, it is the one source of absolute certainty there. And Israel, given its geographic location, given the great roots of our relationship, Israel will remain not only America's ally, but I firmly believe America's ultimate ally. Thank you. Okay. Sandra, you can sit as you wish. I can sit, oh wow, <laughs> that is quite a, a luxury. Doesn't happen a lot in my job. Get water. Yes. Okay. Okay. Fire While the others are, are being collected, mm -hmm. I'll I'll start and I'll let you have a moment to sip some water. I'm mm -hmm. sure you need it. Ambassador, can you please explain how increasing Israeli settlements in the West Bank is part of a cogent plan for peace? Thank you. I wouldn't say it's a cogent plan for peace, but are you hearing me? My microphone on? Now yes. it is. Okay. 
Let's go back. I knew someone was going to ask about settlements, but I didn't want to take up time. <laughs> You've got to be careful with open mics, closed mics these days. <laughs> I've had it happen to myself before. You walk out with these things, you don't know that's still on, and you walk out, boy, those questions, tough. Um, let's go back three steps and understand Israel's settlement policy, because it goes back to 1967, and it has transcended a number of governments, both uh, uh, center, left, r right, up, down. Why, why does Israel, in the face of such international uh, pressure, why does it persist with this? There must be something about these settlements that actually means something. If you, if you look in your Bible and you look uh, for Haifa, you're not going to find Haifa. Haifa is not in the Bible. Um, Ashdod and Ashkelon are in the Bible, but they're Philistine cities. Tel Aviv is in the Bible, but it's in Babylonia. Um, the, the cities of the, of the Hebrew Bible are Jericho, Bethlehem, uh, Hebron, Ophrah. Um, the area that you call the West Bank, in Israel, many people would call it Judea, Samaria, using the Hebrew biblical terms. These are, this is our ancestral homeland. These are the tribal lands of the Jewish people. And it, as for, for a state so constituted as a Jewish state, it is nearly impossible for that state to tell a Jewish person that, they, that he or she cannot live in their ancestral homeland. Very difficult. Secondly, there was a strategic uh, impetus behind the settlements. Israel, in its pre-67 borders, was at its most populous, it was eight miles wide. With our face to mountains, our back to the sea, and those borders were not defensible. Uh, UN Resolution 242, passed in 1967, calls for secure borders for all Middle Eastern states. We didn't feel that border was secure. If you look on the map, 80% of those settlements are clustered around that old border in order to thicken out our border. Now, given the religious and, and, and spiritual ideological content plus the strategic meaning of settlements, it'd be very is difficult for Israel to concede its right to settlement, but in fact, we do. We say that, uh, that there is another people, the Palestinian people, who also view this as their homeland and also have a right to self-determination, to to self and the only way to end this conflict is to divide this land. So we have to take this land, which is so precious to us, which has been sacred to the Jewish people for 3,000 years, and we say, okay, we're going to have to divide it. We're going to have to give it up. We know it's going to be exquisitely painful for us. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, in his recent speech before the joint session of Congress, and by the way, it's another exemplar of the U.S.'s relations, because Netanyahu was one of a few um, uh, heads of state to be invited twice to uh, address joint sessions of Congress, said, and he acknowledged, as head of the Likud, he acknowledged that there will be settlements that will lie beyond Israel's border in the event of the creation of a two-state solution. So we know that that is not what's going to, uh, to, impede, the, to impede the settlements, to set a, a settlement, a, an arrangement with the Palestinians. We know that the Palestinians negotiated with us for about 15 years uh, without a settlement freeze. And we know we reached peace with Egypt and Jordan without a settlement freeze. And we know that we ripped up 21 settlements from Gaza in 2005. And I participated in that operation as a reserve officer. It was the most traumatic thing I've ever been in. We ripped them up in order to create momentum for peace, and we didn't get peace. We got thousands of rockets. So while I would you know, agree that settlements are not a, uh, a contributor to the peace process, the contributing factor of the peace process, they're not the impediment. The element impediment is the willingness and ability of Palestinian leadership to actually sit down and negotiate with us uh, to reach the two-state solution, and then we will look at the border. And there have been plenty of maps out there. You can see that where the border sort of wiggles around settlement blocks and incorporates most of them in the state of Israel. That should not be the impediment. Um, I have a second question here. Let me get a, another pack of them. I'll try to uh, read this rather long, rambling question. Uh, edit it a little bit. There have been Please. recently <laughs> efforts to delegitimize the state of Israel yeah. by spinning freedom and civil liberty into a supposed distraction accusations that universal suffrage, women's rights, and gay rights as a distraction from the Palestinian issue, I know that. And, and so on. Uh, how would you address these charges meant to delegitimize Israel, the freest state in the Middle East? The well, let's look at, at what delegitimization means. Um, there have been many stages in the conflict around Israel. There was a conventional stage where uh, Arab armies tried to destroy us with tanks and planes. That didn't work. There was a, a stage of, of terror attacks, of suicide bombing attacks. That didn't work. Uh, there's been a rocket stage, 
which hasn't worked so far, and now with the, uh, the advent of our anti-ballistic system, uh, probably won't work. Uh, so there is also now the next phase, which we would call by the sort of the generic term lawfare, uh, which is delegitimizing, delegitimizing Israel in international arenas and laying the groundwork for possible sanctions against us, which could prove quite damaging to the state of Israel. Um, and so they'll try to um, impugn Israel's integrity by saying, ah, our rights, our, the, the rights that we give to homosexuals in Israel, our gay rights program, is not really about uh, being a liberal society. It's an attempt to, uh, or they'll say something, pinkwash oppression of Palestinians, or that uh, there's oppression of women in Israel. Israel's not truly a democracy. Um, and all you can do is come back with the facts, as I presented some of them to today, and yes, we have instances of discrimination in Israel. Israel is that type of open society. We're a, uh, we're a democracy on steroids. We have free press on steroids. And people say all sorts of things. And yes, we do have to counterbalance the, uh, the requisites of pluralism with democracy. But all that being said and done, Israel is a vibrant and stable democracy that has never in undergone any interval of non-democratic rule, which is an extraordinary accomplishment given where we are in the world. Uh, be that as may, we have to take the delegitimization threat seriously. And we do not view delegitimization as a PR problem. Um, we don't even view it as a political problem. We view it as a strategic threat because it could lay the groundwork for um, initiatives in various international fora to sanction us. And we are a small country, and though our, our economy is, is rather robust, uh, we could be vulnerable and very vulnerable in a time of, of crisis in the Middle East. And as you know, the Middle East is rather crisis prone. Okay. Um, I'm shuffling the pack of cards, which grows bigger by the minute. Um, I have several here that deal with the question of Iran. Uh, let me see if I can pick one out that sums this up. Um, Do you think an airstrike on Iran, either by the US or Israel, could do any more than delay the development of an Iranian bomb while certainly inflaming the situation? And then another one, do you believe the American people would support US involvement in a strike on Iran initiated by Israel? Hmm. Um, nobody wants military action against Iran. It's the last thing we want. You know, we, as I said, we have, we've never known a, a nanosecond of peace I spent 30 years in the military. I've been through several wars. All of my children have been in the military. I've got a young son who's an infantry officer right now. It's the last thing anybody wants in the state of Israel is more, is more violence. Um, we have been warning about the Iranian nuclear program now for close to 20 years. Uh, I worked for Yitzhak Rabin back in the early 90s. He used to say to us, in, our, in his staff, he used to say, you know, one of the reasons I'm working so hard to make peace with the Palestinians so that we can stabilize our relationship with the Arab world to meet the great threat that's looming over the horizon, that's the Iranian nuclear program. Um, Netanyahu, during his first term in the late 90s, used to say the same thing. It's the greatest threat. About 10 years ago, uh, the international community began to take us seriously, to look at the, the information that we were supplying them and saying, yes, Iran is embarking on a military nuclear program. It took several more years for uh, sanctions to get up and running. They weren't very effective at first. They've become a lot more effective. Uh, over the course of the last year alone, we've seen that, that these sanctions have taken a major chunk out of the Iranian economy. They've, they've done a number on the Iranian currency. Um, but what we have not seen yet is that, that the sanctions have succeeded in any way in impeding the progress of the Iranian nuclear program. In fact, the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency says that the Iranian nuclear program is in fact accelerating. And they have moved parts of this program underground into deep fortified uh, inst installations. They've experimented with ICBMs that can now reach Eastern Europe and are capable of carrying nuclear warheads. Uh, they've sustained a lot of damage from these, uh, from these sanctions, but they're going ahead full thrust, and we believe that they're going to full thrust to create a nuclear weapon. Um, Israel, a small country uh, with certain capabilities uh, next door to Iran, um, has a window. It's a smaller window. America, far away from Iran with different capabilities, has a bigger window. Um, but, and again, that's why I mentioned my appreciation for President Obama saying what he did, that Israel has the right to defend itself and only Israel can decide how best to ensure the protection of its, uh, of its citizens. 
answering the question, it's you know, sort of a hypothetical of a hypothetical. All I can, I can adduce is history. I get to fall back as, on history as an historian. And that is remembering that in the uh, 1981 Israeli attack against the Iraqi nuclear re reactor, the assumption was that that would gain Israel one year of uh, respite from the, Iranian, from the Iraqi nuclear program. And as many of you may recall, uh, that Iraqi nuclear program never came about. Um, we got a lot more than one year. We got 20 plus. So um, nobody knows in advance, and uh, we, can't, we can't speculate. Would the United States support um, Israel in the event of a military strike? There are a number of polls. I get polls across my, my desk all the time. One of the polls I received recently showed that support for Israel in this country is close at an all-time high. Now, the highest was during the 1991 Gulf War when we were being pummeled by, by Scud rockets. But we're approaching that. We're, um, uh, the United States remains just overwhelmingly, fundamentally pro-Israel. And there's a reason why Congress embraces the Prime Minister the way it does and why I get such a great greet in the uncommons, because Congress is reflecting that public opinion rather directly. Um, there are also polls that show significant support in this country for uh, Israel's uh, right uh, and indeed duty uh, to defend itself against all threats, including the Iranian threat. Okay, next up. Um, Yoram Hazoni has noted a decline in belief in the value of nation states. Does this affect support in Europe and America for a two-state solution and for a, a Jewish state of Israel? Mm -hmm. Well, there may be, and Yoram's an old colleague of mine, and I'm going to take issue with him. There may be a decline of support in, in Europe, um, though I don't see anybody actually erasing their borders too quickly in Europe anymore. Um, uh, but the overwhelming majority of states in the world are nation states. Overwhelming majority. And Israel is a nation state, like Ireland's a nation state, like Bulgaria is a nation state. Uh, there's no end of, of examples of nation states. We are different than some nation states, believe it or not, because we do not have a national religion. We are the nation state of the Jewish people. We aren't a theocracy. But there are many nation states, like Britain and Denmark, that do have official religions. We don't have one. Um, I don't think that that, that, that is going to uh, in any way erode support for the two-state solution, uh, any people who are sort of taking issue with a nation state. Um, I think that the major obstacle to the emergence of a two-state solution is the price that the Palestinians are going to have to pay. I think we are reconciled ourselves at least in theory, until we have to do it, to, to, to the price we have to pay, which is going to be exquisitely painful. Listen, we're going to be, we're giving up parts of our sacred homeland, really sacred for the Jewish people for 3,000 years. We give it up. We're taking immense risk. Keep in mind, we pulled out of Lebanon, we pulled out of Gaza, hoping to get peace, and we got thousands of rockets. So it was a big risk. The West Bank is immediately opposite Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. You talk about rocket range, it'll be in pistol range. But the Palestinians also have to pay a very heavy price. And I in no means diminish the price that the Palestinians have to pay. They have to give up parts of their homeland, big part. They have to give up the dream of refugee return, or the descendants of refugees returning to, uh, to what we call pre-67 Israel. It's not going to happen. Israel is not going to be, remain Israel, but not going to be a Jewish state, because it will have a Palestinian majority. That's not going to happen. They're going to have to give that all up, and they're going to have to accept the existence of a permanent and legitimate Jewish state in the Middle East. That's, that's no small thing. That's why we demand, one of the things we're going to seek in these negotiations is recognition of Israel as the Jewish state. It's, it's not semantic. It's as substantive as you can get. It means, we're there per, it means the Jews are a people, and the Jews are endowed with the right of self-determination like other peoples in the Middle East, like the Palestinian people. So it's, it's going to be, it's going to be a, a, a painful process. And once the Palestinians can reconcile themselves to paying that price, I think we can move forward. Ambassador, what is Israel doing on a grassroots level to decrease the level of violence on a local level near the Gaza Strip? And what sort of things will be taken into account when determining a border between Israel and Palestine? Mm. Well, they're, they're, they're two different, yeah, they're different questions. questions. Okay. It's on one card. Like, which one? Do I have to do both of them? <laughs> no, I, along the Gaza border, it's different. Gaza is, 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 is a de facto sovereign entity uh, under the nominal control, though not absolute control, of Hamas. Um, Hamas, if you read its covenant, calls not only for the destruction of the state of Israel, but calls for the destruction of the Jewish people worldwide. It's a genocidal organization. It's not as if we can sit down and start um, engaging in a dialogue with Hamas. They're not going to engage in a dialogue with us. They want us dead. Uh, and they are acquiring uh, weaponry now that can strike central uh, Tel Aviv. And um, repeatedly over the last 
six, seven months, they've, uh, they've fired off some of these weapons, and several hundred rockets. So they're, they're, they're quite serious about it. Um, what we have done is we have eased, to a very extensive ext degree, the, uh, the ground-based blockade of Gaza. Uh, just about anything can get into Gaza today. Gaza has about a 26% growth rate, economic growth rate, and there are no shortages there. Um, we try to restrict certain products from going in, particularly what we call end-use products that can be used, say, to build bunkers, or to build uh, defenses positions, or be used for weaponry. Um, so there's really nothing much we can do there on the Gaza border other than to guard our citizens and hope for a situation where the people of Gaza will say, enough with Hamas, enough with Islamic Jihad, we want to join the peace process and sit down and negotiate uh, together with the Palestinian Authority. As for the other border, the border on the West Bank, uh, that border is going to be influenced by a number of factors. One of them is the demographic changes that have taken place since 1967, and they've been acknowledged both by, by President Obama and by Secretary of State Clinton, the changes of realities in the ground they talk about, and those are what we're talking about, the settlement blocks. But we'll also take into account things like holy places. We're going to have to negotiate that, because there are some holy places that are holy both to Islam and to Judaism. Um, and we will have to take into consideration Israel's security needs because, as I said earlier, uh, the 67 border was not a defensible border, and we want a border will be, as the Prime Minister said in his joint speech to, to uh, Congress, will be very generous on the territory, but we need a defensible border. And we, we want to give the Palestinians a territorially viable and contiguous country. Next question. Mm -hmm. What role has Israel played in reducing Middle Eastern water scarcity, and how will it do so Ooh. in the future? That's a good thing. Israel leads the world in water reclamation. We reclaim 83% of our wastewater. The country that comes in second in the world is Spain with 19% of its wastewater reclaimed. So we are in a category all by ourselves. You may want to think about this next time you're in Israel and you take a, a drink of water from your tap, you may get a sense of deja vu. <laughs> now nah, it goes to someplace completely different. Uh, you can believe that. Um, but we do. Uh, we also lead the world in, in water desalinization. We have the world's largest, we're building the world's largest desalinization plant. And we want our, um, our experience, our pioneering experience in water reclamation um, to, to share it. We want to share it with our neighbors. I mean, as it is, we share it with, with Jordan. Um, someday we look forward to sharing it with, uh, with Syria and other countries. Water is going to be the critical issue in the Middle East in the 21st century. Um, the Nile is going to be a source of, of just untold controversy. You know this. There are nine riparian states along the Nile, uh, and they're still using a formula that the British devised for, for Egypt back in the 19th century. Uh, the Nile has the same amount of water it had in the 19th century, but it's got about six times the amount of population around it, um, and people are going to be short of water. Um, Israel is there to help. Uh, what is Israel doing to protect the rights of secular people in the midst of growing communities of Jewish extremists? Does Israel recognize this issue as a possible threat to democracy? I don't know if it's a threat to a popular democracy, but it is a threat to, um, to certain populations in, in Israel who have been the target, um, whether it be women in certain neighborhoods, and it's only in very, very certain neighborhoods, or, or, or minorities, and Israel takes those threats very, very seriously. As I said before, it is illegal. Discrimination is illegal, um, whether it be discrimination against uh, Muslims or secular Jews. At the end of the day, again, I mentioned earlier, I keep on sort of harping on this, uh, that awesome. Israel has to make a number of calculations in maintaining its democracy. We have to reconcile our democratic values with our security needs, but we also have to uh, counterbalance uh, democracy, democratic values with pluralism. We have growing populations. Many of them are, uh, are religious in nature. And um, a true democracy also has to respect the, the rights of its minorities, um, as we know. Um, in, in the United States has some very similar debates. You know, America, you have these things called obscenity laws on your national television, you know, on network television, you can't say certain words, I'm not gonna say what they are. <laughs> George, George Carlin did it once. Um, uh, you can't say certain words, you can't show certain parts of the male or female anatomy. Where do these laws come from? They come from um, groups in the United States who care about these things, and they are, in a certain way, they are restrictions on, on, on the First Amendment, they are. They tell you what you can and cannot say on network television, what you can and cannot show. 
Israel does not have obscenity laws. You can see any, say anything you want on Israeli television, and they do. You can show pretty much anything you want on Israeli television, and you do. But we have other areas of Israel, certain religious neighborhoods, where they, the, the, the neighbors don't like billboards that show women in bikinis. They have that. There may be, may, may be neighborhoods like that in the United States as well. And then we as a democracy have to decide at what point do we say we have to respect the minority of these people, or what point do we say this is discrimination. And it's a work in progress, as any democracy is. It is constantly reevaluating, constantly recal recalibrating. At the end of the day, Israel, the decisions in Israel are made by the secular government of Israel, by an independent judiciary, a very activist judiciary, the Supreme Court. Um, it is made by the Knesset, which is a secular body, um, and by the government, which is a second, secular body. Though it may have religious members, as there are religious people in government here as well, but it's a, it's a work in progress and a constant dynamic. I'm afraid our time has come to an end. The ambassador has a very tight schedule, and he's at the end of his leash, it turns out. So uh, I'd like to thank you I'm not aware I had one. I'd, I'd like to thank you very much, and please join me in thanking the ambassador. Thank you all. Thank you much. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chicago. Thank you. Thank you.